I'm excited today. Uh, you might not be able to hear it in my voice. I'm still carrying some laryngitis. Thanks to everyone who's been praying for me and my family over the last few weeks. We're slowly getting there. Um, but I am excited to be here today because uh, I get to lead us into the beginning of our next sermon series, which is called Prove It. And it is a journey through what is known as the letters of John. In your Bible, that's first, second, third John. We also have the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, which were written by him as well. But for us, over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at first, second, and third John. So if you want to open up your Bible with me today, you can turn there uh, to first John, which is where we're going to begin uh, if you need to look for it, start at the back of your Bible. It's almost all the way back there. So you can go from Revelation to Jude, then you got 3rd, 2nd, and then you'll get to 1st John. But as we look at these books, what we're going to find is three short books, which on the surface may not seem all that impressive. I mean, you can kind of flip through them with no effort at all and totally miss them in your Bible. And for most of us, if you're an average reader, it would only take you actually about 20 minutes to read all three books. And I do encourage you to do that because as we go throughout this sermon series, there's an opportunity for you to sort of engage at a deeper level. And so uh, we'll kind of go through chunks at a time, a few verses here and there, uh, following an order, but you can easily keep up with this reading. I mean, 20 minutes, you can read all three every day. If that's too much repetition for you, you can just read the little sections that are put out in the Thursday newsletter to prepare yourself for Sunday. But it's really important that though these are small books, that we don't dismiss them because they deal with all sorts of big questions and really important topics that impact us today. We're going to explore questions over this series such as, how does the life we live prove our connection to God? We're going to ask questions about what is doctrinally, so what is our core beliefs that are essential for us to have the Christian faith? We're going to explore the relationship between the ideas of love and tolerance. And then we're going to ask questions such as, what is fellowship? And what does it look like to live in Christian community? All of these things are really helpful for us today because many of them are questions that we face as a church and as a whole world asking questions about Christianity today. And so we'll see that as we go through these three books, we sort of capture a story that is the same piece of history passed down from way back then all the way to today. Because you see what was happening back when these books were written was that there was some disunity in a network of churches. There was a whole bunch of people who were disagreeing. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But what I want us to just understand is some of the background before we get to that place. And so for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to give us some background that will kind of set us up to understand the fullness of what these books are going to address. And then we're going to jump in to 1 John chapter 1, where we're going to read sort of a, a prologue, sort of the, the first part that frames our understanding of the rest of the letters that we're going to read. But as we start, let, let me start with just the author, because this is an important part of the story. The author of 1 John is never actually mentioned in the book. And so lots of people have questions about who could it be. But thankfully, we have 2nd and 3rd John, which are penned by someone who is referred to as John the Elder. And so if we think of elders today, this is the people who are sort of leading the church in sort of teaching of scripture, in prayer, in sort of those emphases of the church. And that's who wrote the book of the day. Now the question is, who is John the Elder? Who is this person? I mean, this was written back in about 90 AD. We don't have a whole lot of question, and so there's actually quite a bit of debate. Scholars have all these questions. Is this maybe John, uh, who was Jesus' disciple, who we know as the beloved disciple? 
Or was this just some other church leader guy named John? I mean, churches all over the place today have different Johns, and they might be elders. And is it just one of those people back in the day? Well, as we consider it, it might not seem all that important. You know, some people just go, well, what does it matter? Who, what does it matter? Who wrote this? Who had to say this? It's in our Bible. That, that should be good enough for me. Well, I don't think that's actually good enough for us. Because right off the bat, as we'll see today, there is something of a relationship that happens between the author of these books and the person of Jesus. And that's where he builds the whole foundation of his case for how we're supposed to view Jesus and view the Christian faith. And so it's really important for us to nail it down. Now, I'm not going to get you to go discover it all on your own unless you want to. I encourage you, you know, if you've got time and some resources at your disposal, go look into some of the different cases. But I'm going to, for simplicity, give you who I believe it is today. I think the person that makes most sense to have written 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is Jesus' disciple, John, the one we know as the beloved disciple. And there's four sort of reasons why I believe that. First is that the writing style is so similar to the Gospel of John. As we're reading through these different books, what I encourage you to do is to also jump into the Gospel of John, chapters 13 to 17. And what we'll actually see is that there's a lot of parallel in the commentary that John makes towards what Jesus had to say in those chapters. And it's written in a very similar way. Second of all, we, of course, know that there's a personal experience as we'll start in our scripture today, we know that this person saw Jesus, they heard Jesus, they physically had touched Jesus, and that's their testimony. That's a big part of what backs their story. And then, of course, we also have that the early church fathers, those first Christian leaders in the church in the first century, also attributed this letter to John the disciple. In fact, Polycarp, who we learned about in our journey through the letters of Revelation, remember he was the, the bishop of the church of Ephesus who was martyred for his faith, was one who said that this was the letter of John. And that's important because we know that this letter is also written, as it seems, to the churches that surround the city of Ephesus. And some of what he has to say here parallels what we read and studied together when we looked at the letters of Jesus to the churches in Revelation. And so you will be able to see those parallels come up. So if John is writing this letter to this network of churches in the Ephesus area, why did he get started? I mean, it was a really expensive endeavor to write a letter in ancient days was a costly endeavor because few people had the ability to write. Few people had the ability to afford sending and circulating the letters. It's not like just sticking in a stamp on it today and sending it out. No, you had to pay someone to take that letter to the different churches. And that person would have to be literate and they'd have to be able to read what you had to say. And then they would travel from community to community. And it wasn't easy in that day. So obviously what it is was of the utmost important. John really had something important to say. And what we'll find as we go through this journey is that there is at the core a bunch of disunity. There's a bunch of fracturing in the church community because of how people view the person of Jesus. You see, there's people in the early church who had to say, you know what? I don't know if what we believe about Jesus is really all that true. They said maybe Jesus never actually came to earth in a physical form. 
Maybe what actually happened was he was this sort of spirit being who hovered along the earth. And, and it doesn't really make sense that God could be a human being. And so that can't be what happened back in the day. You know, we're about somewhere between 40 to, to 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection when this letter is written. And so people are starting to wrestle and have questions about this important part of the faith. And so they're questioning, is Jesus then even really the Son of God? If he was a real person, maybe he's not actually God at all. Maybe he's just someone totally different. And if that's the case, maybe his death and resurrection isn't all that important. Maybe our faith is about something else. Maybe it's about transcending from being physical beings into being spiritual beings. It's all together different than what this guy like John or Peter or Paul has to say. And so as this conversation began to grow within the church, there started to be disunity. Because some people said, you sound like a bunch of idiots. Obviously that's not true. We've heard what they had to say and it's impacted our lives for the better. But there were others who were like, you know what, I don't know. Maybe that's really not what redefines my life. Maybe I can go sort of a different way. And so I'm going to go with these guys and see what they have to say. And so the church starts getting torn apart. And it starts to have all of this challenge within it. And it begins to spread from the first place where this was taught out into the local congregations. And so John... He gets disturbed by this. He gets concerned by this. I mean, he's sort of the the head pastor over this network of churches. And so he has something to say. And so he writes these three books. And let me just give you the summaries. For 1 John, what we're going to see is that the priority emphasis within this book is going to be the truths about Jesus. The things that we had to sing earlier this morning, those things are what John sort of relays. And then as he talks about the truth about Jesus, he talks about how that should impact our Christian faith, our life in Christian community. Then he's going to write a a letter that we call 2 John, which is really to say, what do we do with these people then? If this is the truth about who Jesus is and how we're supposed to live, what do we do with those who are going the other way? How do we deal with them? What should be our our emphasis of those who once maybe were part of our community but have left and gone a different way? And then he writes another letter. And this one, 3 John, is all about humility and hospitality. And so what we see is there's actually a covering of almost all of the Christian faith and what it looks like for us to live in community as we go through these different books. Now the background's very different. I recognize that. The background of what they're going through is very different than the life of Emmanuel Church in 2024 today. We're not a church that's being divided over the person of Jesus Christ. We're not being divided over what we believe that people like the Apostle John had to say about their experience. We're not dividing over whether or not we really are physical beings or spiritual beings. We understand that there's a wholeness and an integrity and understanding that all of the person needs to be surrendered to God. But while we aren't facing those same struggles, we're asking some of the same questions in a different way. And so my hope is that as we look at this church or this network of churches, we can sort of see it as a case study. We can see it as as an example of the struggles and victories that take place within a church community. So that as we continue to strive and grow together as a church, We can overcome some of the challenges. We can avoid some of them by going the other way, away from things that maybe will distract us or take us completely away from the faith. 
And so that brings us to our scripture passage today. I'm going to read 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 4. And again, this is sort of the prologue. This is the introduction that backs everything that John's going to have to say, ultimately through 1 John, but also into the context of 2 and 3 John as well. Let's read chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. John says, that which was from the beginning, that should have some familiarity to us. If we remember the gospel of John, he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. It should also remind us of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning. So John, right off the bat, is starting to paint a picture to tell a story. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Again, remember, in the beginning was the word. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So right off the bat, Right at the beginning, John is addressing the critical matter of church community. And that is that our relationship with one another and our relationship with God are centered on the person of Jesus and what he had to say and what he had to do and what he has accomplished and what he means to you and to me. And it's very clear as we go through this that that John really is concerned for our community and our understanding of what it's built on. In verse 3 and 4, he wrote, I proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you can have fellowship. Fellowship with the Father and his Son, Jesus. And he also writes, I write this so that our joy may be complete. He's talking about a community, right? Our. And he's trying to draw the people in. John, as I said, is distraught about what's happening in the community. And so he wants the people to know, this is tearing me apart. This is really killing me. Like, I love you guys. I want the best for you. And you're just being torn apart by wrong thinking and going the wrong way. And the only way that my joy is going to be complete. The only way your joy is going to be complete is if you understand this central part of our story. That the core of everything is about being in relationship and communion with God the Father and Jesus the Son. And as he says this, what does he use? He uses this word fellowship. Fellowship is this centerpiece Now, it's really important for us to ask the question then, what is fellowship? Because I've got to say, this is a word that has become next to meaningless in the church today. Churches everywhere have fellowship halls. And what that really means is it's the room where you go have coffee. Other churches talk about we have fellowship time together. And what does that mean? It means we debrief are weak. But that is not at all what the word fellowship means here in God's story. The word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia, which essentially means when you break it down into pieces, to have all things in common. In today's day and age, again, we've lost that. That's not what we're talking about when we say, oh, I have fellowship at my church. Or we have fellowship time together. What we're really talking about when we say that is hospitality. But in John's case, this having everything in common is really centered around perhaps what we might identify better as two words, partnership and friendship. 
Partnership and friendship are what we see this word means in the New Testament. First off, it starts with this sense of, of partnership with God. That is that I am working towards what God wants for my life and for the world around me. John understood a thing or two about this. I mean, John was Jesus' disciple. He walked and talked with Jesus. He had Jesus one day say to him, I want you to go out with these other 70 people, and I want you to go share the meaning of what I have to say. Later on, when Jesus would give the Great Commission to send people out into the world to go baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to teach them to obey everything that Jesus had to say, John was there. John heard what Jesus was inviting his followers into. He knew that it had this place to, to say something about partnering with God and what God wanted to bring about into the world. And so as John talks about fellowship, as we read fellowship from people like Paul and Peter and James, we'll see that all through the New Testament, that's what it has to mean. It talked about being on mission with God and drawing close to him. And that's really the second part. This drawing close is about friendship with God. I think there was no better person to talk about this than John. We call John the beloved disciple because of his relationship with Jesus and his relationship with Jesus' mother Mary. John was in the inner circle of Jesus' life. John's the one that Jesus said, I love you. I want to draw you in close to me. He's the disciple that when Jesus was dying, he said, I want you to take care of my mom. I want you to look after her because I can't be here for her physically after today. And so John knew with a deep sense what it meant to have friendship with Jesus. He was also there. When Jesus had this to say, in John 15, 15, we remember Jesus said, I no longer call you my servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus doesn't keep secrets from us, and he invites us in. And John wants us to understand that he doesn't want us to keep distance from God, but to allow God in to everything as well. And so when John talks about fellowship, he's talking about being rooted in friendship and participation in the mission of God. And as we have this fellowship, he gives us sort of these two different types of relationships that take place. In verse 3, he starts, our fellowship, and I think what would better be said is, our fellowship is first with the Father and with the Son, Jesus. But he also talks about this horizontal relationship, right? He talks about us together. He uses the word we, which is talking about the fellowship, the relationships, the friendships that he has with the other apostles of Jesus. You know, we have two relationships broadly speaking, in our church today. Each and every one of us who calls ourselves a follower of Jesus, first and foremost, has a faith, which means we have a relationship with the person of God. Then, flowing from that, what God does is he collects his people in clusters, those who have a relationship with him, and he says, you have a relationship with one another. And so we all have this sort of two-way set of relationships. We have a vertical relationship, and we have a horizontal one as well. And what we need to see is that if our relationship with God isn't right, if our understanding of who he is is misplaced or misguided, then it will affect all of the relationships that are surrounding us today. And so... John begins with telling people that really we can trust and have faith in the person of Jesus. 
And what he does here at the beginning is he really starts to ground people in some sense of reality. And he does this by using the word we, talking about the different apostles and disciples who had been with Jesus. And then he gives the example of what he has to say. He said, that which is from the beginning, God, we've actually heard him. You know, we've actually gone on a journey with him for three years, and we heard a lot of what he had to say and what he had to teach. We saw him with our very eyes. Not only did we see him, but we've touched him. We've been with him. We've joked around. We've given hugs. We've helped carry each other's burdens. And this is what I am proclaiming, that the word has had life, that he's been a physical person, and that as he appeared, he's also given us this, eternal life. The reason that John's doing this is he's saying that there's not something casual, but there's not something that's ununderstandable. It's not mystical. It's not really all that confusing. What happened was that God did exactly what he said he would. That he would come to earth to find a way for us to be in relationship with him. John emphasizes everything that you've heard me say. It's not poetry. It's not fiction. It's reality. And if you don't believe me, you can go ask others. That's the we. The, disciple, the 12 disciples of Jesus, 11 who are still alive at this point. Or go see the 500, as we talked about at Easter last week. 500 people saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. John's saying, go find them. Go ask them. They'll confirm what I have to say. But not only will they tell you that he was a physical being, who we could hear, who we could see, who we could touch, but he's the one who has changed our lives and brought us eternal life. And what he has to say is this, that that will change everything. By understanding that, we change our relationship with God and we change our relationship with others. We change the meaning of what church is all about. For John's church, that meant it would change the relational dynamics that were taking place. It would bring them together. But for us, perhaps it means something a little bit different, but still in the same vein. Perhaps our relationship with Jesus actually gives focus on everything that we're doing together. What we're doing today is utterly pointless. A waste of time and space and effort and money if Jesus is not the way to eternal life. If Jesus didn't really come from heaven to earth, if he really didn't have all to teach us what it meant to have a thriving life and then make a way for it by his death on the cross and his resurrection, we are wasting our time. We're wasting this space that could be developed into some nice new townhomes. We're wasting our money that we give as offering. But if who Jesus says he is and who John says Jesus is is true, it gives such a great depth of meaning. We then have not only just an opportunity to receive eternal life, but we have an opportunity to receive purpose and direction. We have an opportunity to spend our time focused on and living for the God who created the universe. We have the opportunity to have a real reason to gather, to sing, to give, to serve one another, to live our lives in this way. And as we do that, we get a bonus. And that's the bonus of the relationship that we have with the other people here today. And that we don't have to experience that in isolation or by ourselves or in some sort of vacuum in time and space. 
It's not just left to us, but it's actually the gift that's left to all of us to share with one another, to bring meaning to all the things we do together as a church. You know, I think one of the reasons church has really kind of become pathetic in the world around us is because we've done away with making Jesus the centerpiece of everything we do when we gather. There is absolutely no point in us getting together on a Sunday if it's just because we enjoy singing. We can turn on really good music in our car or we can go to a concert and sing with people in all sorts of places. There's absolutely no point in you wasting 30 minutes listening to a guy with laryngitis speak, which makes your ears want to bleed. Because if I'm not saying something of meaning, you're wasting your time, and I'm wasting my energy. Our community groups, if they're just about hanging out, doesn't actually help any of us to grow or to change or to realize who Jesus is and what he's doing. But if we orient all those things and all the different ministries we have, from legacy builders to precepts to men's Bible study to to gathering on a Sunday to, to youth ministry to children's ministry towards the work we invest with our local and global partners, if all of those things become oriented with the focus of us sharing what God is doing and talking about and celebrating him, well, then things really actually might change. The church might actually become an exciting place because it's not about the boring people who make it up. It's about the living God who is moving and breathing and changing the world around us. So as we consider what this fellowship looks like with the living God, I think what we need to do is to change. And that first change is that we need to change the desire of our hearts and our gathering to being about the pursuit of Jesus. Sadly, many of us come to church because it's about the programs that a church has or the different things that it has to offer me. And we come in as consumers. And we come in and we make it about me. But the reality that we are invited into and John says this is all good for is actually about pursuing our king. It's about making it about God, about understanding more about the truth of him, about growing in our friendship with him, about deepening the pace of our, of our participation in what he's doing in our city and around the world. If we could individually press deeper into our relationship with God, And then bring that in to our gathering and community. And instead of just having a conversation on Sunday morning in the foyer of saying, how was your week? But instead saying, how was what you saw with God? How was your relationship with him change this week? Well, then there would be meaning. And then there would be depth. And then there would be life change. Because the little bits that God is doing in us are going to get passed on to somebody else. And instead of Sunday being like a campfire that we walk away from and going out into the darkness and cold, we have an opportunity to bring the flame of what God is doing in our day-to-day together to build a great big fire that can stand as a signal of the world being changed. And that will draw people in. That will change us that will give us motivation that will give us some passion in our lives and it will change the world but if things keep staying this way none of that's going to take place we're going to continue to see the world go by generation after generation of kids who are not going to experience the God of the universe changing their lives because we are too lazy and self-focused to make our time and our efforts focused on him. So will we begin 
to participate in community differently? Will we begin to allow ourselves to be open to the God who loves us, to experience the change that he wants to give us, to experience the good gifts that he has for us, that he's planned for us, that he's waiting to give us if only we would focus on him instead of ourselves and all the other things that take place in our lives. It would be such a beautiful thing John says that it would make our joy complete. Now it's important to understand what John has to say here. Because, let's be honest, for any of us who have been in Christian community for any period of time, we know that it's not easy. Because none of us are easy people to get along with all the time. Some of us get grumpy. Some of us get lazy. Some of us have, you know, some hooks and hang-ups and baggage that maybe makes us a little prickly sometimes. Well, John isn't saying, guess what, you're going to be happy all the time. It's not going to be this great fleeting passion and and joy that we're all going to be singing and dancing like it's a Broadway musical. No, what he means is there's a depth of something that is drawing us in. Let me share with you a definition I read recently. John Piper had this to say. He said, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul. It's not like happiness, but instead it's produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. The joy that comes in fellowship isn't just from knowing that there's other people who feel the same. It comes from that fact that as we experience what God's doing, we have the opportunity to really treasure it in a fresh way when we share it. But also in the same way as other people share with us, we see things that God is doing in ways that we might never have seen before. As we study God's word together, what ends up happening is, we begin to to see how other people understand and have been shaped by God. And we begin to see the beauty that is that God meets every single one of us in different ways, but all with the same focus and purpose. That's a pretty great thing. You know, I love that our church is a bunch of weird faces. I mean, we are a group of people who I don't think would ever get together anywhere else throughout the week except for the fact that we have each had an opportunity to encounter God and by the power of his Holy Spirit, he's changed our lives and brought us together so we can have a greater sense of faith and a greater sense of appreciation. Wow, God did this for me. But God also did something incredible in that person's life. And and their life is just so different than mine. They grew up in a different country. They grew up in a different background, socioeconomic, political, whatever. And we've been brought together. And by sharing, by taking part in who God is together, by participating in what he's doing in one another's lives and in the community around us, we begin to get a greater appreciation for who he is is. And that's what joy is. It's knowing that we can have a peace because of what God has accomplished. That we can have hope for change because we've seen what he's done by grace in our lives and in the lives of others. But sadly, too many of us allow that joy to slip away. We live life and we just go, oh well, Anyways, I guess I'm just going to take on today. And we miss out on the greatest byproduct that Jesus has for you and for me and us together collectively. So would we allow the God who came to save, to continue saving us, to continue bringing joy to our lives, and would we embrace the truth of knowing 
who he is and who we are in light of him today. Let's pray. God, I am just so thankful that you have done work in the life of John so that he could pass down so much of this to us today. But God, that you didn't just stop there and that it didn't just become a good story of something that you did in in history past, but God, that you've done something incredible in my life. God, I can't believe that you would choose to love me and save me. I don't know why you call me a friend. I'm a terrible friend. But God, I thank you that you continue to keep that going in my life. And God, as I consider our, my friends and church family members who are in front of me, Lord, I, I think about some of the different stories I know. And God, how you did incredible things in, in totally different ways in their lives. I thank you for the way you're impacting their stories today. And God, I thank you that you give us that gift that together as a church we can share that and encourage one another about who you are by sharing our faith. God, I thank you for the people in our church family who are going deep with you and who aren't afraid to share it. And Lord, I pray that that would become infectious where we continue to, to experience your grace as we press deeper in, not just individually, but corporately as well. And God, I pray that each one of us, by this time next week, would have had a deeper experience with you, whether that's through prayer, or service, or reading your word, or contemplating what you're doing in someone else's life. Would we have that so that we can bring a flame with us next week to worship? So that as we worship in the front entrance and have conversations, it really would be worship. That our conversations would be laden with with expressions of how good you are, of how you've revealed yourself to us as people of faith. And God, would that create such an energy, such a passion, such a growing desire that as we continue to participate with you in your mission to the world, that we would see change. That we would see people not just look at the church as a dead place or a divided place, but a place of hope and healing. And Lord God, through that, would people encounter you by your Holy Spirit. And God, would that bring joy to you as you extend your grace. So Lord God, we thank you for all of this. Thank you for how good you are. And as we return in in song, God, I pray that we could really reflect on these words and think about how good you are, how about what you're doing in and through us. And Lord God, would that worship be genuine? Would it be true? And would it continue to grow in us in every way? We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.